I once again welcome you to MSB lecture series on main group chemistry. This is my 25th lecture in this series on main group elements. Until the last lecture I had covered the classification of uh, uh, elements in the periodic table, periodic trends, periodic properties and extensive uh, discussion on structure and bonding concepts and then chemistry of hydrogen and chemistry of group 1 and group 2 elements. So, today let me begin my lecture uh, with chemistry on uh, p block elements. To begin with I will be considering uh, group 13 elements and of course, just if you look into the periodic table on the right side, we have 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 okay, uh, groups of totally 30 elements and of course, we have 31 elements including helium and here uh, we have group 13 to group 18 having electronic configuration in their valence shell starting from S 2 P 1 in case of group 13 to S 2 P 6 in case of inert gases or inert elements. So, let us discuss today on group 13 elements. Okay. Uh, group 13 elements have valence shell electronic configuration of N S 2 N P 1 that is S 2 P 1 that means they have 3 electrons in their valence shell. So, boron is typically a non-metallic element with little metallic characteristics and rest of the elements aluminum, gallium, indium and thallium all are metals. Boron forms a large number of cluster compounds known as boron hydrides and also one can incorporate uh, other p block elements also. I will be discussing all those things in more detail and also I will be talking about the structural aspects pertinent to boron hydrates using weights rules and aluminum is the most abundant uh, group 13 element in the earth's crust. So, uh, all these group 13 elements show higher first, second and third ionization energies uh, for boron compared to other members. Of course, always there is some difference in their chemical reactivity when you compare the group 1 element with rest of the elements here no exception. So, boron behaves little different than uh, aluminum, gallium, indium and thallium because of its uh, smaller size and high charge when it goes to trivalent form. And let us look into who discovered group 13 elements and uh, boron was discovered by Louis Jacquis Theonard. Of course, then it was isolated and in pure form by Humphrey Davy and aluminum was discovered in 1825 by Hans Christian Oersted and gallium was discovered initially by Paul Emily Lico D in 1875. Indium was discovered by two chemists Ferdinand Reed and H. T. Richter in 1863 and the last element in the series thallium was discovered by Claude August Lamy in 1861. Of course, you can always go into Wikipedia to know more about uh, these elements and the history of discovery and to know more about these chemists. Let us uh, start with boron. Boron is a fairly rare element uh, with abundance uh, is about uh, 0 0.00. 0 0.1 percent by mass in the earth's crust. It exists in two isotopic forms or it shows two isotopes having 10 boron. Uh, its abundance is about 19 percent and 11 boron it is about 81 percent. Okay. The most common sources of boron or borax this is nothing but Na2B4O5 OH 4 times having 8 H2O molecules and another one is carnite. Okay. So, it is also very similar to borax, but it only differs in the amount of 
solvent it is there hydrated uh, water molecules solvated water molecules Na 2 B 4 O 5 O H uh, 4 times, but it has only 2 molecules of water. They are essentially hydrated sodium borate hydroxide minerals. Aluminum is the most abundant element in the earth's crust approximately it accounts for 8 percent, 8 percent by mass. It occurs in numerous clays and aluminosilicate minerals, but the commercially most important mineral is bauxite. Okay. It is a complex mixture of hydrated aluminum hydroxide and aluminum oxide. And in case of gallium, gallium oxide occurs as an impurity in bauxite and is normally recovered as a byproduct of the manufacture of aluminum. So, when you are processing and extracting aluminum from bauxite, uh, essentially more and more gallium oxide will be concentrated and using an appropriate metallurgical process, gallium oxide can be reduced to gallium. Gallium, indium and thallium occur in trace amounts as sulphides in various other minerals. Okay. So, you can see here the relative abundance of group 13 elements is given here. Uh, it shows okay, the most abundant among them it is aluminum, next boron comes and next gallium comes and indium is in small quantity compared to uh, thallium. So, let us look into the extraction of uh, this element to begin with let us consider boron. So, here the borax is converted into boric acid. So, the whatever the borax I, I showed okay, that is first converted to boric acid by treating with sulfuric acid and then to boron oxide that is B2O3. The oxide is reduced with magnesium and washed with alkali and then hydrofluoric acid. And of course, if you want extra pure or ultra pure boron, one can prepare by reducing boron tribromide with hydrogen in vapor phase. Okay. Take the uh, vapors of uh, uh, boron tribromide and react this one with gas H2 to get the pure boron. Okay. So, uh, let me show this uh, metallurgical process. So, of course, uh, one can start with uh, borax Na2 B4 O5 OH4 times. You can also write like this, this is a better way of writing and treat this with sulfuric acid. Okay. So, what you get is 4 BOH thrice, BOH thrice plus Na2 SO4 plus 5 H2O. Okay. So, this uh, BOH thrice on heating it gives B2O3 plus 3H2O. So, uh, one can use uh, magnesium as a reducing agent. So, simply take B2O3 plus 3Mg it gives 2B plus 3 MgO. Okay. So, in case of uh, uh, boron tribromide one can use hydrogen. So, here in this case gas plus 3 H2 gives 2B plus 6 HBr, this is solid, this is gas. So, this is how one can get pure boron. Okay. So, boron crystallizes in a variety of forms all containing icosahedral B12 unit. Okay. You can see here, uh, this is how the boron, this is one of the boron uh, minerals I have shown here. So, pure boron has a composition of B12 and having the geometry of icosahedron. So, we have essentially 12 vertices. 
we have here. This is the other way of showing using a space filling model B12. So, let us look into aluminum. So, aluminum is extracted from bauxite. As I said, it is a complex mixture of hydrated aluminum hydroxide and aluminum oxide having all kind of impurities with the major impurity being iron oxide. So, from which aluminum is extracted by a, a standard procedure uh, introduced by one chemist called Hall Herold. Uh, his name is shown here and uh, this is known as here Hall Herold's process. It is an, so essentially in larger production this his method is used. I will be elaborating on this method. Okay. So, bauxite uh, essentially Al2O3 to H2O and another ore of bauxite is thorium hexafluoroaluminate. So, that is bauxite is essentially Al2O3 to H2O okay. and another one is cryolite. Cryolite is Na3 AlF6 sodium hexafluoroaluminate. And of course, uh, as I said, bauxite contains Fe2O3 and silica, okay. So, and other several other impurities are there. So, in order to isolate pure aluminum, these impurities must be removed. This is done by a well known procedure known as Bayer's process. Bayer process. So, in it involves uh, treatment of bauxite with sodium hydroxide Al2O3 plus 6 NaOH plus 3 H2O gives 2 Na3 AlOH 6 times. And of course, uh, silica readily reacts with sodium hydroxide to form sodium silicate so bauxite treatment with sodium hydroxide solution results in in sodium aluminate so this is sodium aluminate and also sodium silicate so iron part remains behind as a solid okay so now we need to worry about uh, iron uh, when CO2 is blown through the resulting solution, when carbon dioxide, sodium silicate stays in solution while aluminum is precipitated out as aluminum hydroxide. This hydroxide is insoluble, it can be filtered off, washed and heated to form pure alumina. Okay. So, this one on heating it forms aluminum oxide plus 3 H2O comes out. So, this insoluble aluminum hydroxide is filtered off and this is heated to form pure alumina. So, the next stage involves the purification or reduction of aluminum oxide to get pure aluminum. Uh, it can be obtained by electrolytic method in aqueous solution aluminum oxide dissociates into ions. cathode aluminum at so on anode
So, overall uh, is 2 Al 2 O 3 electrolysis. Four Al plus three O two. Okay, so this is uh, electrolysis is necessary as aluminium is very electropositive. So these days, electrolysis of the hot oxide in a carbon lined steel cell acting as the cathode with ca with carbon anode is used in electrolysis. So, the metal is obtained by electrolyzing the dried alumina in molten Na3Lf6 that means sodium hexafluoroaluminate. So, why it is done this way is essentially um, by adding sodium hexafluoroaluminate reduces the melting point of aluminum oxide. It is very similar to the down process we employ in case of the extraction of sodium uh, from sodium chloride. So, elemental aluminum cannot be produced by the electrolysis of an aqueous aluminum salt because the hydronium ions that are generated readily oxidize elemental aluminum. So, although a molten aluminum salt could be used instead, but aluminum oxide has a melting point of 2072 degree centigrade. We just look into aluminum oxide, melting point is So, uh, so this is uh, because of high temperature, so electrolyzing is impractical. So, in the hall herolds process, uh, aluminum that is Al2O3 is dissolved in molten synthetic cryolite that is Na3AlF6 okay. and it essentially Na3AlF6 is used to lower the melting point for easier electrolysis, okay. pure cryolite has a melting point of 1009 plus or minus 1 degree centigrade with a small percentage of alumina okay, dissolved in it the melting temperature can drop to as low as 1000 degree centigrade. So, then at this temperature it is not a problem to do molten electrolysis. Okay. So, let me write the reactions involved in molten electrolysis. So, aluminum is produced at cathode gives 2 Al ok. This is cathode ok and oxygen gives O2 plus 6 electrons. Okay. So, overall reaction can be written in this fashion. Of course, uh, here uh, we are using uh, carbon. So, one should also write alternatively in a different way. So, here one can also write this one as 3 O 2 minus plus C gives CO plus 6 electrons and here Al 2 O 3 plus 3 C gives 2 Al plus 6 CO. Okay. So, in, in reality uh, although it appears like CO is formed in fact more carbon dioxide is formed at the anode than carbon monoxide. So, overall equation can be written in this way that is employed in the purification or isolation of aluminum starting from aluminum oxide using molten electrolysis. So, this is the overall reaction that represents okay, reduction of aluminum oxide using carbon to form aluminum through the formation of carbon dioxide. So, gallium as I mentioned is normally a byproduct of the manufacture of aluminum from bauxite. The purification of bauxite by the 
Bayer process results in concentration of gallium in its ratio from almost 5000 to 300 in the alkaline solution from an aluminum. Electrolysis using a mercury electrode provides a further concentration and following electrolysis of the resulting sodium gallate using a stainless steel cathode, okay, one can get uh, gallium metal. Gallium metal has a melting point of 29.76 degree centigrade. one of the low melting metal. So, preparation of pure gallium requires a number of further process ending with zone refining to make very pure gallium metal. So, I would uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, zone refining when I discuss group 14 elements especially in the purification of silicon to get ultra pure silicon for semiconductor or electronic industries. Crude thallium is present as a component in flue dust along with arsenic, cadmium, indium, germanium and lead. The flue dust contains, contain essentially arsenic, cadmium, indium, germanium, lead, nickel, selenium, tellurium, zinc. Okay. <coughs> so, here uh, thallium is also there in it. Okay. So, so, thallium is essentially prepared by dissolving of flue dust in dilute acid precipitating out lead sulphate and then adding HCl to precipitate thallium chloride TLCl. Uh, further purification can be achieved by electrolysis of soluble thallium salts. So, with this information about the extraction of uh, uh, group 13 elements, let us look into the properties of group 13 elements. First, let us focus uh, on covalent radius. So, covalent radius is increasing down the group as expected and similarly metallic radius is also increasing down the group and ionic radius is also increasing as expected uh, with boron having 27 picometer whereas thallium has 98 uh, picometer. Melting point is decreasing as expected again following strictly the periodic trends and boiling point is also decreasing and, and first ionization energy should decrease down the group. Uh, that is what the trend is observed. Okay. So, here for boron first ionization enthalpy is 799 kilo joules per mole whereas for thallium it is 590 kilo joules per mole and of course, this is little higher compared to indium essentially. Uh, the second ionization enthalpy if you take it is very high in case of boron and, and of course, uh, second ionization potential is our ionization enthalpy is relatively higher than the first one as expected for all group 13 elements. And in this case, in case of thallium it is little higher compared to gallium and indium again it is because of inert pair effect. I would tell you what is inert pair effect later. Uh, the third ionization energy is also expected to be decreasing down the group with boron showing uh, highest value of 3660 kilo joules per mole. Uh, and of course, this reduction potential also comes very handy in understanding their behavior. Okay. In fact, thallium shows uh, uh, positive value 1.26. Let us look into some similarities between boron and rest of the elements in the series. Uh, aluminum has many similarities with beryllium that we already discussed about diagonal relationship. For the group 13 elements, plus 3 is the most stable oxygen state and stabilization of lower oxygen state that is plus 1 for the heaviest elements in the group appears in the case of thallium for which in fact plus 3 oxygen state is oxidizing. Okay. So, here for the first time the term inert pair effect is introduced among the p block elements okay. and of course, uh, more and more elements uh, heavier elements of group 14, 15 and 16 show this inert pair effect. Uh, it is very interesting to understand and correlate 
inert pair effect with respect to the reactions and stabilization of lower coordination number that I am going to discuss in my next lecture. Uh, until then, thank you very much and have a pleasant reading of inorganic chemistry.